Welcome everybody to the Citrus Circuit Fall Workshop Series presentation, Why 2056 is the Best Elite Team to Copy, presented by Adam Hurd from Team 973. Adam is best known for his spicy Chief Del 5 posts, in addition to being champion of the world in 2017. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so what we're going to do today, first we're going to go over some slides that are actually from Team 26, kind of showing some of their culture and some of their build method, and then we're going to look at three of their seasons and focus on some of the trade-offs they made um, that I think are a, little more, are a little more aggressive trade-offs than you see a lot of elite teams make, and why they are a more approachable elite team to copy if you're a team that, that's on the way up. So let's start by looking over their slide. Um, so this one's really big, set goals for everything. I think you'd be surprised by the number of teams, and if you go up to that team and ask five different people on that team what the goal of the team is, how you will pretty much always get five different answers. Um, and that's going to make everything you do over the course of the season less effective, because when you guys are arguing and talking about things, design, uh, you know, process stuff, that sort of thing, people are often coming from different frames of reference. Someone might think the team is here to build cool stuff, someone might think the team is here you know, just to focus on teaching the kids. Someone might be thinking we're here to win as much as possible and we don't want to focus on those two things. So if the whole team isn't on board and understands a singular goal, you're going to have all sorts of conflict. The other half of that is, and I feel really strongly about this on our team as well, and we've copied a lot of their stuff to the secret of success. If we are here in shop, if we're having a meeting anywhere, there's a reason we're there. We don't just meet and show up and then figure out what we should do. There was a goal before you even got there. Because if you don't have a goal, there's no point to even being there. So focusing on both of those can add a lot of productivity and, and save a lot of time. All right. This is kind of a nice generic point. Um, a lot of people think you really, really got to focus on the big stuff. I think it's incredibly rare for teams to miss really big stuff. And they almost always overlook the details. And the accumulation of small details is what makes the big stuff work well. Um, I think a lot of people are surprised by this. Um, they actually don't meet all that much in person. So what's that total up to 30 hours? Uh, we meet Tuesday, Thursday, 5 to 9, Saturday, 8 to 5, no, 9 to 5, and Sunday, 1 to 5. So we total 20 hours. But we do expect the students, you know, especially on programming design, to put in a fair amount of time on their own. So um, this number is probably a lot lower than a lot of people think. But they're able to do that, and, and we're able to do that with a lower number as well, by having goals and being really focused in our approach and not allowing any time to. All right, next one, please. Um, they're just talking about their ability. Oh, they're talking about when they practice. Uh, I think this is really cool. So a lot of teams, and we're kind of in the bad habit of this, kind of bank up their practice and will practice really long days, a couple days a week. They practice every day for a shorter amount of time, which is really cool. And it's my understanding at those lunchtime practices, their coach is actually at work watching the kids at school practice with the webcam. So they don't even have to have the coach come out for that one. So that's like no exaggeration, literally every day from bag day until their competition today. All right. Um, obviously, you need to find some course for you guys. Um, you, you may need to meet a little more as you transition to be more effective, but. We've certainly found meeting less and being more focused has been really valuable. I'll be honest, I didn't review these parts of the slides that great. So he's just talking about what you can do during the competition season. So this is you know everything between bag day and Saturday champs. I feel like a lot of teams on the way up, if they don't have a practice or a lot, really don't meet and do that much stuff in this time. However, there still is a lot of valuable things you can do, especially in these bottom three areas, if you don't have a practice or a lot. But I would really recommend if you're aiming to compete at this kind of level, you, you really obviously need to practice or a lot. And that's covered like in Mike Soto's presentation. So. All right. Any questions on build schedule or anything in that area at all? Sweet. Decision making, um, I think most groups without a clear uh, facilitator in this area make that decision. Obviously, decisions are the way you decide things, and that's where a lot of teams have a lot of trouble. Um, you see a lot of teams voting, you see a lot of teams kind of not making a decision as a group and you know putting things off, and then you kind of get stuck in some corner. Um, this team heavily biases towards it's better to make 
a potentially suboptimal decision early and start executing on that and making progress in that sort of thing versus pushing decisions out late and making what might be a much better decision but with much less time to implement that. Um, this last bullet point is huge and you know really mirrors what you'll see. Uh, I guess you're not doing the nice presentation right now, but if you went through it last night, learn from others. Don't invent stuff you don't have to. Copy as much as you can from other teams out there. That's what industry does. That's what we should be doing here. Put all of your creative efforts into the improvements on that and not into the duplication of stuff that's already out there. All right. Knowing your limits is a huge one. So, uh, Karthik on 1114, if you go to the Symbotic website, has a very good strategy presentation. Talks a lot about that. Mike Pesetta's presentation, I keep referencing, talks a lot about that. Don't do everything is obviously a good one. Um, a, a robot that only does a handful of things really, really well is going to be much better than a robot that does four things at a subpar level. You know, as soon as your robot is at an event, has features that you're not using in a match, that means you put resources to something that is not adding value. You have the resources, but you spent them. You could have put those resources to the things that you are competing with, and those things would be better. All right. Um, for the other elite team, I think these guys are super simple. They're generally going to have more degrees, I'm sorry, less degrees of freedom. They generally have simpler fabrication methods. You know, maybe their frames look a little less elegant than you'll see in some other teams, but it works. They're very robust, and they're done soon, and uh, you know, I, I think they're really good at not getting caught up in areas where another elite team might go, we really, really want to optimize this spot. So they go, we're not optimizing that at this point. We're going to get this stuff made, start practicing, maybe we'll fix it later if we need to. But generally they don't. Generally they play at champs with the same robot and they get to a regional. Um, this is kind of rehashing earlier stuff, but pretty much they make decisions early, they make trade-offs early, and they really buy it for practice and testing and implementation and stuff so that you can discover these issues while you have time to fix them. Um, this is kind of a tough one. I, I don't think every team should cut everything. I think if you are aiming to compete at this level, you absolutely need to cut everything. Um, so that's kind of what that, you know, or not, or your resources is. I don't think there's many elite teams that don't cut just about everything. Uh, questions on any of that stuff? I'm really trying to speed through this and get to the robot. But now it's great time to ask if you have one. All right. Oh, yeah? Yes. It's hard to answer in quantity. You know, there, there's going to be a different bare minimum in different years, and there's some years where to even be viable in the game, you're going to have to push a little past your resources, and that's tough. But most of the games have a point where you can just do a couple things and, and still be fairly competitive. You know, like 2015 was a real bummer. 2015, if you were not good, you were very, very bad. You know, probably 80% of teams. No, really, there's there no value to be able to score full points in that game. Um, most years have something a little more coachable available then. Oh, build your resources. This is really just rehashing all the stuff at this point, but I think it's really trying to drive that point home that you gotta take your resources. Oh, and just getting ahead of me. Um, similar stuff. Um, I really believe that it, if you can take away as many decisions as possible, that can be beneficial. Decisions really weigh people down. So there's a lot of value in standardizing things. Even if that means maybe some of your stuff's a little suboptimal because you're always doing the same things, there's still a lot of value in that time save, not having to stock multiple things, not having to order it because you already have it, that sort of stuff. All right, now we're going to the robots. So we're going to look at 2012, we're going to look at 2016 and 2017. 2012 is a little harder to talk about because it's a long time ago. Teams weren't as good as they are now. And also, their robot does kind of look complicated. But when you add up all the technical problems they had to solve versus a lot of other teams, it was still a lot tougher than a lot of other teams. So, uh, I don't know if you want to watch the video and talk about it. Yeah, let's watch the video. So we're going to watch a video from 118 in Texas. It's one of those NASA memes. Boo. <laughs> uh, they actually weren't super complicated this year. This is a pretty simple year for them, I think. But this year's game, essentially a basketball hoop on the side of the field you had to shoot in, and then you had some dry oh, blocks that you had to deal with. Let's suppose that you're ready or really.
You want me to go back to the beginning or stay here? Okay. The beginning is like the cut You want to just mute, talk over it? Let's just go back. Okay. So uh, this was when vision was still really hard. The, the stuff you got in the kit of parts wasn't that great. You said a lot of do work for it. Um, there weren't any off-the-shelf cameras that were viable. Um, the team we just saw had really advanced vision where they would aim at turret and they would set their shot distance with this. But what that means is at home and then when you get to the events, you had to tune that shooter in. You had to figure out if I'm this far away and you shoot at this RPM. I'm this far away and you shoot at this RPM. You do that all the way back. And then they had to tie in your camera to that stuff. So if something gets moved or bumped a little bit or your shooter starts acting a little different, that's a lot of stuff you've got to tune in. And that can be really, really stressful for teams at events. 2056 said, no, we're just not doing vision at all. We're going to point blank our shots, but we're going to shoot from distance and just manually aim. Um, we'll see, some of this will make more sense as we watch the match on the next page. But a lot of teams had independent systems for all of these things. Um, and not that many were able to combine that many features. So we're going to see this 2056 robot, 2056 robot that doesn't look that simple, but it is a lot simpler than the other teams right here. So let's take a look at it now. This was like an epic match at the time. Three, two, so they're on the left in the middle. So they have a turret on their shooter, but they actually never really use it at the turret. Uh, they use it so they can point backwards like they are right now in auto, so that that shot is just a little closer. Um, and then so they don't have to turn around in auto for stuff. Um, and then they use it to look like 15 degrees left, 15 degrees right, for when they come up to do these point blank shots pretty soon. Um, and how they did these shots is they would just aim their head a little left or right, they would crack yeah. their bumpers into the barrier, and if the kid was lined up left right within a couple inches, those balls went in. And their accuracy there had to be 90 plus percent. There were a lot of really, really good teams with camps that were probably averaging like 70 percent. 11-14 had a really similar drive. Uh, this year, that center barrier really tripped up a lot of teams. A lot of teams had independent mechanisms that were just for that. They would like jack the robot up, or they had some the skirts to lead in. Both of these teams, I think, made a great choice. And that uh, this was kind of in the era everyone had learned small wheels were good. And never it was dumb to do big wheels. Um, and teams weren't quite hip again to drive obstacles. Both of those teams went with eight inch pneumatic wheels. That's the first year they were on the market for FRC. So they could just drive over that barrier flawlessly. So a lot of other teams spent a lot of time and resources to solve that problem. And they just said, fine, we'll go back to old school FRC, run big wheels, people might make fun of us, but we're gonna be able to cross that bump a lot faster than other teams. And you see a lot of other elite teams this year would stay on their side of the field and never cross because it was just so slow and expensive for them to do so. And both these robots would kind of cross at will. Oh no, skip the barge. Well, that was, you want to. So you got a bunch of points at the end, like a disproportionate amount. If you could get three robots on that bridge instead of two, which was really tough. They had a little, they just strapped a cylinder to the side of their intake to help balance the bridge there. This is cool because I think it was the first time 2056 and 1114 had actually played each other in a lens. I could be wrong about that. First, first time 2056 what was that? defeated them. Yeah. yeah. They still had the streak going then. So if you look at a picture of this robot versus another elite team that year, they don't look that much simpler, but they pretty much skipped all the expensive development in terms of vision or drive frames that a lot of other teams spent a lot of time on. And they were able to get done really simple about two and go. And uh, those shots that you saw 118 doing with the turret and lining up and shooting, I'd say there were only a handful of teams in the world that were making shots about vision. 2056 is one of them. They had a very novel approach. It looked like they were just lining up randomly on the field wherever. But what they were actually doing is, depending on which driver station they were, they would put the robot between the kid and the goal, and then they would just line it up straight. And if the robot looked the 
in line to the kid, then therefore the ball's going to go in. And they actually had a pretty good shooting percentage doing that when there were maybe like five teams in the world not using vision to reliably make the shot. All right, let's jump to 2016. We got citrus in this. These two robots are both very awesome, but they both have a lot of stuff on them. And we're going to watch a video with both of them. So Duty 4 was this low robot, really fast. They had a turret. Um, their intake was on the opposite side of their shooter, which was kind of this popular feature everyone wanted that year. You want to go with the intake on the back and shoot out the front. They had a separate mechanism because of that to deal with the defenses and stuff. Who's seen 2016? I'm sorry. We have a lot of people here. All right, we'll see it in the video a little more. 2016, you had gold on either side, kind of like 2012. And you had, instead of one central set of barriers, you had a set of barriers for alliance that were much more complicated. So there was a fair amount of development you had to put in just to get a drive train to go over the field, which then made all these other features that much more expensive. Um, 1678, actually they got the robot here. They were a big arm with an elevator on it. They hung with that arm. They could use that arm to extend where no one could block their shots. That was a big feature a lot of other people wanted. Um, you know, they could have a defender in front of them and shoot right over them. Um, they had a separate mechanism from their intake to handle the defenses. And once again, their intake was on the opposite side of their shooter, and they used vision. Although 2656 is vision this year, too, so maybe I should have put that in there. Uh oh. Oh, this video is not. Oh, it missed the timestamp. So this is SVR finals. Oh, wow, good timing. Uh oh, spoiler. Final one? You want final two? It doesn't matter. Just something to see both of them drive. At this point in FRC, the vision software you got to get apart was appreciably better, and it was much smaller time speed to get vision working than in 2012. All right, so you got 1678 at the very closest here in red, and 2B4 the very farthest in red. Oops, 2B4 did not make that shot. <laughs> So you can see their arm here, and then that separate system to go deal with that defense with the little wedges. You had to push those down to get over it. And even though these other systems don't seem like that much, it, it all adds up. And it's that much more to do in two. Let me skip ahead. How much of this do you want to watch, Adam? I don't know, it's 20 seconds, maybe. You guys get a chance to see both those robots decently, or you want to watch a little longer? All right, let's go to 26. This is probably my favorite year for this team, so I think it's just like their most simple year. So this is the robot up top, no turret, they didn't have an unblockable shot, their intake was on the front side, so they'd have to pick up a ball, and if they were going the other way, they'd have to turn around and score it. They had all sorts of negatives like that that most elite teams on kickoff said you could not be good with that feature set. You need at least some of those features. Um, I also really like, we didn't really, uh, you might jump back to 2012 real quick. Uh, you can't really see it. You can just barely see this blue wheel on the top of their robot. We go back to 2016. They're running pretty much the same shooter. Um, you know, why reinvent it? They already got it working for them. I know they actually prototyped the 2016 robot with the 2012 one. They also had the advantage of they were one of the few teams that ran those big wheels in uh, 2012, so they had it ready for 2016. Um, I know most elite teams, even though in theory we kind of learned the lesson in 2012, just like everyone else, wasted way too much time trying to figure out a drive that would go over those things. So they were way ahead of everyone else because of the ability to reuse their older stuff. Um, they did have a hanger, although I think they would have been almost as good without the hanger. Yeah. So let's watch the match. Oh, great match. And they're only a degree of freedom other than their hanger. They just had intake coming up and down. And that's how the intake falls, and that's how they dealt with the defense. So they're in the very back of red there. Oh no. We yeah, skip that auto. Oh, there, oh, we go. oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, they just didn't want to hit 118. So there's some vision doing some aiming. year on a good team was putting in a new shooter or at least appreciable changes to their mechanisms at every event they went to. 
and 2056 here. This is an off-season event in July. Okay, it's playing with the same robot as their first event of the year. They might have changed some small details, but they didn't change anything. Um, another really subtle feature, I don't know if we'll see any teams do it, but these crisscross guys here, a lot of teams wanted the ability just to drive over those with speed. They wanted to put an angle on the front, and they consider it to be a waste of time if you had to drive up to that and then do something to lower it. 20 6 said, well, we don't need to have another mechanism if we're willing to just lower those with our instruments. So you see them do it here, and they just patterned that enough because they were done really early. Um, that that wasn't an issue for them. You know, so they were able to eliminate a feature on their robot, knowing that because they eliminated enough features, they'd be done soon enough to get that much more practice in and be able to do those things easily. And they missed champs by a five point that week. They were world finals that year. And they won one of the matches in finals, right? It's two to one. I think so. Any questions about 2016 before we move on? Sweet. 2017. Almost everyone here probably has seen the 2017, right? Most of you saw 2016. Great. Uh, so 2017, we had to shoot a lot of ball. And all the elite teams are freaking out. The number I kind of heard a lot was you need to make 20 or 30 balls a second or you're not going to be good. And obviously, none of us had photo bets even close to that, and we were all freaking out. Um, so a lot of teams made really complicated mechanisms to feed their balls really, really fast. Um, so there's 118 again, same team from Texas, although this is a little more fancy year for them. Oh no, yes. It's real sensitive, yeah. Sorry. We just. Based on like Yeah. This is the best shot right here. What's the best shot? Oh, there we go. Same intake. Uh, so a lot of teams had over the bumper intakes like you saw there, so they could pick up balls even wider. And then here, ball intakes on the same side. You have the ability to pick up gears off the floor. Let's jump ahead. 2056 said, we don't need to pick up gears off the floor. We're fine with just promoting. They did actively place them at least. Um, they were fine with their gear mechanism and ball mechanism being on opposite sides of the robot. They didn't do a turret, and they didn't do any fancy ball funneling. Um, so you saw 118 kind of crisscross uh, ball funneling systems. You had some teams that had these like cool pie clones, like 3310. They were pretty sweet. They just did conveyors, 
And I don't even think they had sideways conveyors like 1678 did with the conveyor. It was just a single straight share. So they shot a little slower than other teams. Um, oh man, neither did Victor Scheller. They're using the same blue wheels. And neither did Victor Scheller, unfortunately. Um, so they were able to heavily, le he ah, heavily leverage pretty much everything they did in 2016 to get going on this road. So where are. Bottom they? left. Bottom left on red. I didn't make this happen, but those 118 row videos are like all my daughter wants to watch on YouTube. So I watch those like four times a day. I'm kind of sick of them. She doesn't want to watch other teams ones. Uh, she doesn't want to watch Baby Shark anymore, at least. But she, she says, see robot, and then we have to put on 118 videos. So where are they at? Back right. So we'll see in human load and score a couple years here. And what I'm really impressed with is a lot of the teams that shot this year, us included, spent a lot of time lining up to shoot. When they lined up to shoot, they were really just reusing all their 2016 vision code. It's super quick. I can skip a bit. And their intake is just a gap in their bumpers of the roller. They're something that came over the bumpers. And you can see a couple of these spots when they swoop through a lot of balls, they fill their hopper up no problem. They shoot from the same spot, they shoot in autonomous. Yeah. And one of the advantages of not shooting from multiple distances is that's only one RPM value to keep your busy. We were actually so screwed that year, we didn't use vision, we had a flashlight, and you aim left right with the flashlight, and you put the flashlight at the right height on the bowl, and that set your distance. So we only had one value to keep tuned in effort. And it was the same value for auto, it's just whatever value is working for auto in event, that's what they adjusted the flashlight to work to tell you off. So if you ever went to the practice field, you had one thing to care about. And they, and they had a fairly similar approach, but they were doing vision for that. This robot almost made it to Einstein finals. Well, it was in the round robin. Yeah, yeah. They think they were one win away from being in the finals of the Troy Champs that year, but they were good in the round robin for sure. So uh, that's all I got. 20v6 is definitely my favorite elite team to look for from that like cultural point of view and inspiration on how to go simpler and that sort of thing. Any questions? And the questions don't necessarily have to be just about 20v6. They can be about that earlier stuff about you know, how to go simple and build season schedule and that sort of thing. All right. I'm easy. What's yeah. Up? That's a tough one to answer with the universal truth. Uh, the workshop I gave at lunch gets a little more into that, but it still kind of gets an unanswered. Um, and that's kind of a gamble you've got to make. I mean, would you rather be definitely a better robot, but kind of cursed to be like the sixth to eighth Alliance captain? Or do you want to optimize to be the, the third pick of a better team, which might win, but is a worse robot? It, it's hard to say. And then those both of those goalposts move when you get the chance. And, you know, everyone gets that. Uh, but you also have to qualify for chance, which you know can complicate that. I think that's tough. Yeah, the question was what types of how do you make the decision on what to cut um, oh, so based off game strategy? Sorry, I missed that. I and think asking, like, what is the goal of that decision? I mean, so first you have to do what I just said there, figure out what are you even aiming for, uh, and then from there it kind of just comes from strategy experience. You know, so to 